and welcome. In this lecture, we're going to be talking a little bit about climate change literature. So as we all know, one of the oldest and most fascinating forms of art is the expression of stories, the expression of use of words to convey to one another uh, our thoughts about something or to describe something from our imagination and share that with one another. So uh, literature, uh, and here we're talking about literature, both refer referring to nonfiction stories, but also fiction related stories, uh, is one of the forms that has increasingly been used to talk about climate change and what possibilities it has. So climate nonfiction uh, is uh, it can be a range of different things. Uh, here's just a picture of some uh, a project, which is called the Climate, Climate Stories Project, where people from all over the world have pr provided the world with different stories about their experiences with climate change. Um, so when we're talking about these types of nonfiction stories, there's a range of different things and ways that they're used. Uh, one is to talk about actual events from people's personal lives or to try and talk about environmental situations that are happening and tell stories about what's going on there. Um, very often they come from personal experiences uh, and they can also be narrations of how people go through these environmental challenges that they're facing in their communities. Um, one of the ways in which this is used is to try and connect the reader with the reality of these experiences that they might not be experiencing directly th themselves and to help connect them to these environmental situations uh, that are really troubling for the future of our Earth. So there's a, a field called climate fiction or cli-fi as it's shorted, uh, sh uh, described shortly, uh, which is sort of similar to the abbreviation sci-fi. Um, and climate fiction is really talking about the Im impact of changes in climate, uh, particularly climate change. So climate fiction has been going on for a really long time. Jules Verne wrote a book back in the 1889, uh, The Purchase of the North Pole, where he talked about how the Earth had gotten off its axis and suddenly everything became very cold. Uh, but uh, current writers are using uh, climate in their, in their writing quite a bit. Uh, so we see many quite famous writers, such as Margaret Atwood, Ian McEwan, Kim Stanley Robinson, Jeanine, uh, Jeanette uh, Winterson. So a lot of these writers are trying to talk a little bit about what climate might look like in the future and what we can expect, how that we can expect that to affect society and our ecosystems and uh, tell stories to sort of create a vision around that. These stories are often dystopian, talking about the things that we can fear uh, going forward about these potential risks that we're facing, but they don't have to be. Some of these stories do have a more utopian view to them. There's a genre called hope punk and solar punk that I just want you to be aware of, which is more oriented towards that positive view of the future. So hope punk is a little bit broader than climate related work, but it's talking about fiction that's trying to emphasize caring about the future and optimism around it and uh, encouraging people to take action, right? So instead of having this nihilistic view where this is viewed as inevitable and there's nothing we can do about it and it's all depressing, Hope Punk is really trying to solidify our optimism around this. Um, and it's a deliberate political act to write in this way. Very often these stories emphasize community building and trying to think about social solutions to problems. Right. These stories often also include the idea that people can be have feelings, have softness to them, uh, be kind to one another and appreciate one another. And it doesn't view that as being a negative thing and often integrates it into that idea of that caring is actually an important component to actually moving forward and actually wanting to engage in this action. And uh, it also recognizes very often that there isn't sort of simple solutions, that their progress is an ongoing effort, that uh, we will need to continue working on this, and that uh, these are often complex problems. Now, there's a subgenre which is called solar punk, and this is um, 
a genre that you could describe as being a subgenre of hope punk or a subgenre of cli-fi climate fiction. And this is uh, an, an area that uses sort of the same strategies as hope punk, but really is focusing in on renewable energy. All right, so let's turn for a second to talk about literary criticism. So when we're talking about literary criticism, what we're talking about is uh, a critic or somebody who's read and looked at uh, a piece of literature who's made a, an assessment of that literature about the quality of the work and what it means. Now, as I'll say, as I said before, and I'll say again, remember criticism is not just negative. Very often we talk about criticism as just as being a negative thing. So we take something, we pull it apart. Good criticism, in my opinion, tries to highlight the, both the positives and negatives of a piece of work, right? And when you present a judgment, when you pr present your assessment of work, you want to be able to justify that based upon your assessment of what those different elements and components are that you're assessing in it. Now, criticism is really important. Remember, when an artist provides their work, this is a very vulnerable thing, but it's also a way in which they, they want people to actually talk about their work. They want people to look at it and think about it, right? If an artist does work and nobody pays any attention to it, nobody criticizes and, and thinks about it, in some ways that's a failure for their work, right? So uh, criticism and critical assessment is actually really almost I wouldn't say part of that artwork, but it's part of what that artwork means. In some ways, what's really important about it is that it can actually help put that that piece of artwork in a larger context so that people understand what it means in the bigger picture in terms of the field or in terms of uh, ecosystems or climate or other political things that are going on at that time. And it also can help make that artwork more meaningful to the audience that's reading it. So. When we're thinking about criticism, um, one of the first things that I'll ask you to think about when you're reading a piece of literature is what emotions do you feel? How, how are you responding to this? Because that can highlight what the work is doing, what the, what that piece of literature is doing, right? Uh, and that's going to vary depending on the person and the perspective that they're coming to, but that's can illuminate what this art, what the intention of this art is, or what uh, perhaps even the unintended consequence of this art is. You can also talk a little bit about what mood was brought up by this piece of piece of work. Um, and another th way to sort of look at this is to try and think about when you read this these stories, what was unexpected or surprising to you? What did you learn? What's what sort of new about it that sort of strikes your interest, okay? Um, that's another thing that we can sort of see in terms of just these personal visceral responses to a story. Um, another element to uh, a story is the plot itself, so uh, particularly for fiction. So there's a few different ways that we can assess a plot. First off, what is the setting of the story? So understanding where it's set, you know, and what that setting means to what the story is that sort of unfolds for us is actually quite important. The other thing is that most stories center around the conflict, right? There's something going on that's an issue, that's a challenge that people overcome, that there's a conflict of values. There's something going on there that is the core of that story that, that, that makes it interesting, right? So identifying what that conflict is can be illuminating about how the story unfolds. You can also think about what the point of view is that's presented in the in the story. So who's the narrator? How how is it um, a view from nowhere? Is it essentially some objective narrator from outside? Or is it someone telling their own personal story? Right? What is that point of view that's being conveyed? Then you can also talk about the characters. Who is the protagonist or hero? Are there antagonists or anti-heroes, right? That that are carrying out the story. And what do they what do they mean as characters? And when you're thinking about these characters, one thing that can be illuminating is what are they doing? Do, are they believable characters? Do they feel like real people? Why do they do they why do you think they do or do they not, right? Uh, how does their dialogue evolve, right? Uh, we've all read stories where the people just don't feel real, 
right? They seem like they're just there to deliver a political message or something else. And that can sort of, sort of highlight to us the skill or essentially our critique of the quality of this, of this literature. The other thing that we can think about is the way that time is used in this, in this piece of work. So is it a very short period of time? Does it jump back and forth uh, in the way it uses time? Is it a very quick, fast-paced moving thing? Or is it sort of a slow, uh, atmospheric kind of story that gets you really set within a scene, right? So these are, th these are ways that you can critique how the plot unfolds. And then there's, of course, just the dynamic story of how this how the story evolves T a typical story has rising action you increase the conflict then you have some sort of climax where th uh, the conflict is resolved or something occurs that sort of explains what's going on in the story and then you have falling action where you sort of have some sort of resolution to the story you also in literature you also have a range of different devices that writers can use to tell a story so one of the common things that you'll see in, in uh, pretty much any story is that the, art, the writer will try and create some sort of tone or, or mood in the story. And they can do that by having it be very clipped and short-edged, or it can be very rough and uh, jolting, or it can be a very smooth and atmospheric and welcoming and warm uh, piece of writing. It really just depends on what the artist, the, uh, the writer is trying to convey in their story. Um, sometimes they can even use tone to create disjunction or, uh, or, uh, increase attention. So you can move from one type of tone to another sometimes in the story to actually emphasize that jolting change, right? Another element to story, uh, assessing the story is thinking about how did the artist create imagery within the story? Can you imagine yourself within the story? Can you imagine the setting, the picture? Can you picture in your mind what's going on there, right? So uh, some stories will be very abstract and won't have a lot of that, and some will create a whole world that you can really imagine yourself being in. You also see some techniques uh, that relate to time, which we've already discussed a little bit, but things like foreshadowing. So sometimes a story will hint at something that's going to happen later to sort of set that up, set up that curiosity within the story. You can also have flashbacks in stories. So sometimes in order to make explain what's going on in the story, somebody can think back to a time before, or uh, uh, you can interject a, a previous story into a story to talk about what happened prior that sets up the story or creates tension. Or you can start off with that flashback to sort of set up a future story to raise that tension. Um, writers often also use symbolism. So sometimes you'll have an object or uh, or some type of description in there that's supposed to actually symbolize something that's larger or bigger, right? So sometimes you'll have some sim symbolism that is sometimes understood within store uh, within our culture. So very often using red to s simulate violence or um, or unrest or chaos, you know that can be a symbolic thing. Or using different types of objects that are associated with different ideas. Uh, or sometimes we can talk, uh, a writer can talk about an object, and they're not really talking about that object, they're talking about something else. And we understand based upon how that story evolves, that something else is really happening. Um, you also can have allegory used in, in writing. So allegory is when you're telling a story within a story, right? So um, for example, Animal Farm is a, a, a story that's often used to describe this, where they talk about a farm and they talk about different animals and how they interact with each other politically. But this is really an allegory for communism, right? So it's, it's, it's talking about something as a story that actually describes a bigger idea or picture or, or something that's going on that, that, that sometimes is better illustrated by having a smaller story with uh, concrete examples, right? Another thing that uh, writers often use is metaphor and simile. So saying, for example, that my heart is made of stone. I don't actually mean that my heart is made of stone. It just means that there is, you know, it's, it's, uh, 
you know, an emotional weight, emotionally weighty thing that I'm facing. And similarly would be my heart feels as if it is of stone, right? So those are just ways of using, um, illustrating a feeling or an idea using a metaphor for with another object, right? And then there's analogies, right? So making uh, connections through an, an analogy of saying, you know, this thing is similar or connected to another thing can also be another way that artists try and build connections or or tell a story verbally. Um, another way that we can look at stories is looking at framing, right? So framing is a way in which a writer sort of constrains the work that they're doing, all right? So they're thinking about, I'm, I'm gonna talk to this audience in this way to try and convey a message or a story or an idea that I'm interested in. So, um, you know, a story might tell certain things, but it might leave other things out, right? So you might be talking about climate change, but you might never mention politics, for example. But politics might be a really important comp component to this, right? So when we look at a story, we might want to think about what is included and what is not included in that story. And who is the, the writer trying to talk to? Who is that intended audience? Are there assumptions being made about who they're talking to in how they talk or how they describe what they're doing? Um, this is important because sometimes works of art actually exclude certain groups of people, right? And that's actually important to understand and think about in terms of the implications and meaning of, of a piece of writing. Once we've sort of looked at these different elements, it's uh, appropriate to sort of start thinking about what is the overall impact or theme that's being conveyed by this? What is this, at bottom line, what is this work trying to say to the reader? What is it trying to do? Um, what ideas are trying to illustrate? What types of emotions is it, tr is it trying to generate? What is the purpose of this, this story? Um, the other, another way to angle to look at this is what is sort of new or important about this work, right? So bottom line, why do we care that this story was written, right? Why does it make a difference to, to us? When we look at a piece of work, it's also kind of handy to look at it in a larger picture. So you can look at it in the context of a field. So you can pair it to other, other types of writing or, you know, the types of work or scholarship that's happening in the field. Or you can take two different pieces of work, two different articles or, or stories, for example, and compare them to one another to sort of illustrate how they're different or similar, right? And this can sometimes help us to understand not just the meaning of an individual piece of work, but understand that piece of work in the larger context of a field. All right, so that's a very quick rundown of some of the things that we think about when we critique literature. Uh, I hope that this is helpful for you. I know that's a very quick sort of introduction to these ideas, but uh, it hopefully will give you some ideas for things to look for in the stories that you read or things to think about as you might consider writing your own stories. So thank you very much for listening. I hope that's helpful and uh, take care everyone.